indeed with a very warm heart that we welcome you to today's episode of Tax Matters. My name is Ulumu Iwa Matuloko. How's your week been? And how is business going? We're now in the last quarter of the year 2017, and we pray to God Almighty that we coast home and witness the end of the year and be among those that will witness 2018 in prosperity and in good health of body and mind, and that our businesses will prosper so that, of course, you will pay your taxes. Let's begin by informing you that the 2017 edition of the PwC Media Excellence Awards has taken place in Lagos. It took place on Friday, the 6th of October, and winners emerged in all the four categories, including tax reporting category. We'll bring you the story of that award ceremony in the course of this episode of Tax Matters. But the main item on the agenda is to take a critical look at value-added tax, VAT. Value-added tax was introduced into Nigeria in 1993 via the Value-added Tax Act 102 of 1993. Prior to the introduction of VAT in Nigeria, the different states of the Federation were operating sales tax. But VAT was not new to the world. Germany had introduced value-added tax way back in 1918. 99 years ago. France followed in 1937 with its own variant, which it called production tax, which was later modified in 1954 into a consumption tax. With regard to other parts of Europe, the then European Economic Community, EEC, had insisted with the introduction of the Treaty of Rome in 1957 that any country desirous of joining the bloc must introduce value added tax. And so other countries in Europe joined the bandwagon as the years rolled by. In Britain, value tax was introduced in the year 1973 as a replacement for the purchase tax, which was cumbersome because it had multiple rates. This was to fulfill the condition that had been set by the EEC. VAT is a consumption tax that is charged on a product or service at every stage of the production and is borne by the final consumer. The incidence on VAT is borne by the final consumer, even as VAT is added at every stage the value is added. VAT is charged at different rates across the countries of the world. In Nigeria, the rate of VAT is 5%. Value added tax is a tax paid on all goods and services and remitted by the seller of the goods or provider of the service to government. 5% VAT is added to the total cost of goods and services in Nigeria and when remitted to government is used for funding development. The VAT you pay will be used by government to develop our transport infrastructure like roads and railway lines to continually improve our educational sector by building more schools and upgrading existing ones to provide adequate security and a better quality of life for us all. Pay your VAT. Make your contributions to the development of Nigeria it pays to pay your tax. This message is from the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Value-added tax is generally considered a simple, easy-to-collect tax type. It is also considered a cash cow available to governments all over the world desirous of raising revenue in an easy-to-collect manner. This was our view until we had the privilege of attending one of the 15 sessions of the recently held third international conference on tax in Africa organized by the African Tax Administration Forum in Abuja, Nigeria. To better our point as to what is the general view of VAT, listen to this Amazon. Uh, when I led uh, the VAT implementation team in uh, Zimbabwe in 2004, um, what we were using to sell VAT was that um, it is, char it is, it, it is, uh, it is the, the, the easier source of revenue because it is easy to manage, uh, because it is charged at every stage of the production chain. And so even if you miss one uh, point, you can always collect it at the other stages. Uh, it also provides an audit trail. Uh, so taxpayers cannot hide because you can always go after them. The other thing was that uh, it is neutral because it is paid on consumption and that it is not a cost to 
business. But my experience here in West Africa is that uh, those qualities of VAT have actually not been very true, uh, especially to business, because one, um, there are a number of um, exemptions. Um, what I find is that uh, a number of administrations in West Africa have decided not to issue refunds um, as a way of minimizing their risk. But uh, I think what is not uh, recognized is that uh, uh, those that are given, either if you don't give tax credits on especially capital expenditure, you are actually putting a cost on the business. And also, if you're not giving a refund and you're giving a tax credit, um, you are already giving a refund because taxpayers are going to claim what they owe from income tax and other taxes of that credit. So you are actually paying them refunds. But you are distorting your revenue administration. That should set the tone for a discussion on the matter at hand. At the beginning of it all, the chairman of the session had this to say. You will agree with me that uh, the VAT is known as uh, the best way, the most effective way to raise revenue. And uh, in Africa, out of 54 countries, 44 use uh, VAT as a tool to levy uh, government revenue. But VAT, uh, like other taxes, is vulnerable to tax evasion and uh, VAT fraud. VAT fraud and other forms of uh, leakages have a negative impact on the tax systems. So the discussion, we address the VAT fraud and other form, form of uh, of tax leakages and their impacts on tax system. Like the chairman had said, the VAT fraud is there with us and um, we know it. It's, in particular in Nigeria, it's quite um, pervasive and quite worrisome. Ordinarily, one would have not thought that it should be so because um, VAT is said to be characterized by the ease of collection. Why? Because it is levied on goods and services that are dear to you and I, things that we cannot do without your clothing, your shoes, your accommodation materials. And in Nigeria in particular, we think it shouldn't have been so because, again, the VAT rate in Nigeria is very low, 5%, probably one of the lowest in the world. And in Nigeria also, it's levied on import and in other jurisdictions. So when you import goods, you pay VAT on it. And we know that Nigeria imports a lot, virtually everything. Our economy is said to be driven by consumption, so we consume a lot. And yet, we still discover that we have a very low level of compliance when it comes to VAT. With our GDP, that stands between about $405 billion as of 2016, could have been higher, but for the exchange rate. When you try to look at that and compute ordinarily, what should be our VAT at 5%? It's a far cry from what we have today. And so that confirms the topic we are discussing, that is a huge and lot of leakages in Nigeria. And so the question is, why? We try to check the statistics, for instance. The level of VAT filers in Nigeria, as we speak, is clearly below 70,000. That is in a population of, give or take, 160, 170 million people. Registered company in a database in excess of 1 million. And yet, we can't boast of 100,000 tax filers that file for VAT on an annual basis. So this tells us the magnitude of the leakage that we are experiencing in Nigeria. Shocking statistics. Very, very shocking statistics. The situation is, however, not peculiar to Nigeria. The causes of VAT fraud are, are 
pretty straightforward. We know them all. And, and one of the, the first key points, it's easier said than done, but one of the first key points that I see is that tax authorities still often haven't gotten their head around is to sort of understand their tax base, uh, sort of not the tax base, but our t their taxpayer base, their population, um, and to understand to what extent their population might be vulnerable to the typical sorts of VAT fraud and how they can address these issues purely by the design of policy. If you quickly look at the main causes of VAT fraud or VAT non-compliance, VAT leakage, it starts with the very simple, you know, businesses not registering. Um, and, and, and very often that, that business, that is more of a problem where you have very low thresholds. So you, 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 you spend a lot of time chasing very small businesses to register, probably with, with very little uh, yield of, 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 of revenue. And then when we go to those that have registered but that are not really complying by through you know, under-reporting sales or uh, mischaracterizing sales, also there, there is a bit of work to do to, to look at where the most vulnerable ones are. Those mo might be the ones that do not really understand the law, that have deal issues with dealing with, with complexity. And then we slowly enter into the, f the real fraud space, which is very often linked to sort of organized crime. And that's the space of re collecting and, and not remitting the tax. Um, not um, false claims of refunds, um, false traders sort of printing invoices to, to generate refunds. And that's then again another area that those, those are criminals. So what is the way out? It is a major problem. And then we're trying to see how this can be resolved. Um, our experience is that when we saw this, and like many competitors have said today, we try to deepen the tax base. And the data is a major issue. You need to know who indeed you really want to tax. The number of people in the tax net are very minimal. And like many people have said today, there seems to be a disconnection between the government and the governed, the tax authority and the taxpayers. So we need to do a little bit more in terms of getting them educated to know why they need to pay taxes. There's a huge disconnection between us. So we continue to engage them enlighten them to let them know that we cannot attain the country of our vision as long as we continue to, to go on in this poor tax compliance culture. Of course, we have things that we have been doing across the country to ensure that we limit the effect of this. An awful lot can be done through the tax design. Um, and, and I have to keep it very short here, so very simple. If you start with a, a, a broad base, a broad tax base, with not too many exemptions and exceptions, on the one hand, that allows you to keep a low rate, which creates disincentives for, for fraud, because at a low rate, you know, fraud is, 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 you know, the risk is still there, but the yield is, is, is lower. A broad base with a low rate also allows you to reduce the number of reduced rates and exemptions which create complexity and often misclassification um, uh, fraud, which then allows you to sort of focus on the areas on, despite making it easy to comply, despite, you know, if you have to, have to surround it with communications policies, really reaching out to taxpayer services, re reaching out to your tax base, and then focus on the real issue. And often it's an issue of just criminal fraud you know, refund fraud, false info. People printing money, you can print money by, by printing false invoices. I'll just keep it there for the moment, but I see an awful lot of room for progress uh, there in the countries where we have worked, and that's not just here in the continent, but, but for instance, exactly the same issues in, 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 in Eurasia. Um, exactly the same, you could almost copy-paste them. VAT frauds is not an African issue. Yeah. Really global. Because the research show that uh, even the EU, there's a gap, uh, a VAT gap around uh, 100 billion per year in the EU. No, no, it's, 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 it's huge. So within the EU, the EU countries, the VAT gap, so the losses of VAT due to non-compliance and fraud, is about 170, 170 billion euros per year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And a lot of that is due to so-called missing trader fraud, at least half of it, which is one particular type of fraud, and again, which involves, it doesn't involve regular business. I mean, regular business gets drawn into it um, um, involuntarily, but it's organized crime. A lot of it, we found that a lot of it is actually being organized out of a limited number of, of countries in Asia. VAT fraud is not an African issue. However, if, like Mr. Batoa said, shorter list of exempt items and low rate of VAT are antidotes to VAT fraud, how come that in Nigeria, for example, where the rate of VAT is 5% among the lowest in the world, how come VAT fraud is not minimal? Or is it? The jury is out. Mr. Alfred Akibo Betts is from Sierra Leone and has his own perspective. When we're implementing VAT and uh, when we explained it, um, this was like eight years ago, so 2009, 2010, and I remember particularly one politician said to me, the VAT system encourages fraud. And I was taken aback because it was funny the way he said it. And he actually explained and actually came to realize his point. It's the fact that you have a system wherein government is saying, collect money on my behalf, then you can give me the money. And because we don't have strong systems in Africa generally, it means that, and obviously the trust for the taxpayer is less, because all the trust is actually in the taxpayer. It means that that taxpayer has to hold on to that money in some cases for up to maybe two months or so, it depends by when he sees the money, and come give it to, 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 to the government. So it means that, generally speaking, it's a good system, and obviously we want money from it, but the way it's designed, it, it actually kind of encourages when you, have, when you have a situation where taxpayers can't be trusted. But obviously there are many, many issues surrounding that which can be solved. So one thing you did mention when you start was suppressing sales. But what you also notice is that not only suppressing sales, but you have situations wherein you taxpayers actually suppress input tax credits. That's a lot. And the reason why taxpayers do that is because when they show the tax authority their tax credit that they have this particular amount of tax credit that they're going to claim from the tax authorities, it means that they now know that the tax authority will expect this much output tax. So it means that more um, revenue. So we notice that when you actually look at their data, we talk about data integrity a lot, when you look at information from different sources, especially, let's say, customs information, what they actually report for customs information or maybe what's their, um, uh, what they're actually buying and actually having proper VAT invoices for, they don't actually claim it, so they actually suppress. Going to the point about the missing trader, um, I went to a conference about a year ago, and one particular country did mention something like that. It's, it's very common, obviously, in the EU system where you have this missing trader issue, and obviously it's not something we're thinking of much in Africa. But it goes back to the issue we're discussed, which was discussed earlier on with respect to registration. And what was happening in that country was that because they didn't have good registration systems and obviously procedures, people were not following it properly, um, the integrity of the taxpayer database was a, um, was a mess, it meant that taxpayers were registering just to engage in fraud in an organized um, manner. So what was happening was that different taxpayers would come and register, and obviously because the systems were not good, they were able to register easily for VAT, and uh, they will invoice themselves into different, different companies, which are actually maybe shell companies, and the last person in the chain, or the person in the area, which who is actually claiming it from the Revenue Authority, he's saying that, well, they did issue me a proper VAT invoice, and what, what can the Revenue Authority do? So it meant that when you go into the system, you can actually trace those companies. And on the other hand, that person is claiming his input tax. So there's no way you're not going to say you're not going to give it to that company. So that's also another issue. Um, Charging VAT when they're not registered is also something that we don't talk about a lot, but taxpayers do it. So some taxpayers in some countries, or even in our case in Sierra Leone, will say, okay, well, I have a tax verification number. So it means that when I have a tax verification number, I am automatically registered with VAT, which 
it's not the case because they actually need to come and register for VAT also because maybe they're not, they're not registered the registration threshold, et cetera. So what you have in those cases that, or even some of them just want to collect the government's revenue and not give it back to government. So what they will do is that even when they're not registered and obviously they're not filing, they're not going to file returns, they do charge the VAT and they don't hand it over. The laws are there to say, okay, we can go after them. But in some situations, what we've, we've actually found that out when maybe we've gone to audit somebody and uh, maybe we're verifying the input tax claims and we're saying, well, this person is not actually registered for VAT. Why did they actually charge you VAT, et cetera? So these are some of the issues. What we've done in Sierra Leone, um, we obviously know it's an issue and obviously it's not like we've solved all the problems. But one key thing that can be done is actually looking at data from different sources. And uh, the points made earlier on with respect to liaison with the Ministry of Finance, liaison with other government institutions like the procurement, um, uh, national procurement, liaison with telecom companies, they do have a lot of information on, on suppliers, big companies, etc. So what you'll notice is that when you look at the data from these different sources, you can actually pick out to know some of these people that actually are not reporting their VAT um, to the government. So that is very, very important. And what we're seeing also in the world now is a situation where in tax organizations, tax authorities, sorry, they actually build in data analysis teams. And coincidentally, we have Faith here. Maybe Faith can talk a little bit about it. Through, um, through their program, through the IMF, we've actually had a lot of training on that and a lot of capacity building on that because we've seen that it's actually yielded a lot of revenue, which is, which is very, very important. And... Uh, there's, there's no doubt about it with respect to risk-based audits. Some companies, some countries also in Sierra Leone, we're actually thinking of introducing electronic tax registers. Um, I think in South America, Southern America, what they're actually thinking of in the future is to have a system wherein it's a government e-invoicing system, wherein when you're invoicing, you can actually invoice and it will go through the government system. So governments will have that in real time. We must confess once again that we remain shell-shocked. This has indeed been an eye-opener. One would have thought that value-added tax is a very simple, straightforward tax type. But as you can see, we learn every day. We have so much more to tell you, and so this story has to continue next episode. The lady from the IMF, Faith Mazani, still has a lot to say, plus what members of the audience contributed to the discussion. And of course, we have to go back to the panelists for the way forward as preferred by them. In rounding up, let us tell you part of the story of the 2017 Media Excellence Awards of PWC. Stand up, for the champions, for the champions, stand up. As we told you at the beginning of the episode, the 2017 edition of the PwC Media Excellence Awards has taken place in Lagos. It took place on Friday, the 6th of October, 2017. There were winners in four categories. The winner of this category, Business and Economy, is Victor Equalo. The next category, and that is Tax Reporting, and the winner is Collins Mweze. So next we have Capital Market Reporting. And the winner is Inkuruka Nora. of the 2017 PwC's Media Excellence Awards for SME Reporting is Isaac Anyaogo. We specially congratulate the winners in the tax reporting category. They follow our footsteps and we do promise that next year, will clean the first prize. A fuller story of the award ceremony 
will come to you in a subsequent episode of Tax Matters. We spoke to the winners in the tax reporting category. We also spoke to officials of PwC to find out from them why PwC is doing this. Let us meet again on this forum next week. Same station, same day of the week, same time of the day. Have a blessed week ahead.